All right, so uh, we're here in Natural Trap Cave in Wyoming, right on the border of Montana, where we're uh, digging up Ice Age mammals um, down in the pit uh, behind me. Um, this is one of the richest sites for megafaunal mammal bone in the lower 48 states in southern Canada. And uh, I'm here to uh, take, I've just taken a bit of a break to talk uh, and answer a couple of uh, blog questions that we've had uh, posted. So we figured while we're down here, we'll do it um, on the job, as it were. So what's the first question? What's your personal favorite project that you've ever worked on? Uh, I guess my, my, my personal favorite has is, is actually been a series of them. It's, it's, um, uh, I've ever had this list of really puzzling evolutionary mysteries, things like the Falkland Islands wolf or the American cheetah, which we're finding bones of right here or um, an American lion, these animals which have been such mysteries. The next one is always the most exciting uh, project to do. Um, I suppose though overall the, the, uh, the bison, how bison have evolved, how they're affected by climate change, that's the one that's had the biggest scientific impact so far and we're still working on bison in Europe and North America. It's one of the reasons actually we're here. One of my main interests is more bison. But, I mean, anything from dodo to, you name it. So, uh, at some stage, I have to write a list and stick it on the web of all the weird extinct animals that we've actually managed to get DNA from and understand the evolutionary history. And each one of them is its own detective story. What methods and protocols are you using to prevent modern DNA contamination while we're excavating? So, um, what we're doing here um, is doing the basic work, removing the um, soil on top and the initial uh, analysis using just standard gloves, um, leather gloves or, or whatever, which is good for dirt and rocks. I actually tend to use bare hands. But as soon as we're getting towards samples, um, where we can see specimens that are coming out that are well preserved, uh, then I'll put on uh, latex gloves, uh, and if we're really worried, a uh, breathing mask as well, to stop our DNA getting onto the animals, the, uh, the bones. There's not too much chance in here of modern DNA other than pack rats, which are living up near the entrance there. In fact, one of them is just over here looking very sad on a rock because he fell in about three days ago. We came down one morning and there was a pack rat just on the ground at the bottom of the rope. He had obviously been watching us the day before and decided to have a go. Uh, so pack rat uh, urine and droppings are on the floor, so that's actually a bit of a risk. But uh, when we're digging these bones out, we're often um, a foot or, or several metres down into the sediments. So the modern DNA is not too much of a risk at that point. As long as we collect it, uh, so we don't put our DNA on it, then the genetic work is relatively easy, uh, other than the fact that DNA is all destroyed from being very, very ancient. How do you assess the bones to determine whether or not they contain retrievable DNA before you analyze them? Um, I'll show you that um, in a minute, um, because uh, you, you get a feeling from, from working on many bones, I've been doing this for you know, 25 years or so, I've looked, <laughs> looked and sampled a lot of bones, and you start getting a feeling for what the external signs are that would tell you there's DNA still in a bone. The weight is a particularly good one, other than unless it's got dirt inside it. Um, the smoothness of the surface, looking for surface cracking, the colouring, the roughness. Um, there's a whole bunch, and I'll show you, we're going to do some sampling, and we'll video that, and I'll indicate why I'm choosing certain samples and why they're better preserved. But that's a really something that comes with just experience, uh, and you're just looking for good um, preservation, something that looks like it's not that destroyed, as opposed to something you can just snap because it's so rotten. Uh, but it's often slightly hard to predict, and I'll show you some examples here which are quite confusing. The outside looks like rubbish but actually when they were broken excavating them, the inside is a tiny little bit of well-preserved material. Are there any parts of the animal that are better for DNA analysis? Um, we've done all of our work until this date, uh, until last year or so, primarily on long bones. So particularly the leg, the femur, and the, and the tibia, um, or in the herb herbivores, the radius and the ulna, which because they're very heavy, they, they take a lot of stress, so they're very solid, and they tend to survive better over time. But uh, there is increasing evidence that maybe even the little um, phalanges, little finger bones, might be very good because even though they're not very hard in terms of weight bearing, um, when a body dies, the flesh here quickly um, degrades and disappears. 
as around the body, there's so much muscle and, so, uh, and, and, and mass that the bacteria eating the body uh, also do a whole bunch of damage to the bone. So we're starting to think that the peripheries are quite good. Um, however, um, in a site like this where we've got a bit of moisture running around, the other thing I'm looking for is teeth, uh, because they're so hard, and particularly the roots of the teeth is where we, um, we find it's easy to take a sample from and get good quality DNA. But pretty much it'll be suck it and see when, whenever we pick this stuff up. How, did you man how do you manage the trip back to Australia with the bones from Wyoming? Yeah, well, that's a difficulty. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Laura, actually, who's filming this, is our postdoc, and she'll probably be carrying them back for me because um, I'm going through a couple of museums to do sampling on the way home, and it'll be very difficult to keep the samples cold in the American summer through um, various museums. Uh, what we'll do is we'll put them into a cooler, uh, keep them with ice packs, and keep them trying to, to about four to five degrees centigrade, about refrigerator temperature because that's what it is in here, and the aim is to try and keep it as close to that uh, so that there's no changes in the material before we get it back to the lab in Australia to do the analysis. Have you ever experienced issues at the border with your samples? Yeah, yeah, Australian uh, quarantine uh, folks are very energetic, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the permits that we have to bring this material back in um, they're obviously, often the people at the border are not too aware about how they work and they're, they're very perplexed and surprised when you turn up with this paperwork and it can take up to an hour of people reading and rereading re -re 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 the form before they finally decide that you do in fact have a permit to bring soil and water and uh, various other dangerous items into Australia. We can only do it uh, if we take the material directly into the ancient DNA lab which is um, uh, specially rated to allow work on such material. But yeah, uh, it's a real uh, pain every time we go through Australian um, uh, quarantine, unfortunately. Uh, but you know, you've got you to deal with it. It's a fairly serious issue for Australia. They can't let in seeds and other bacteria or, or viruses. Um, so yeah, we, we understand the rules um, and uh, you have to deal with it. What is the size of the sample you take, and what happens to the rest of the bone after you sample it? Well, I'll show you um, the size of the sample that we take and, 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 um, and what happens to the bone afterwards in a minute when we start doing the sampling. But normally it's about a centimetre square, and uh, we can use that to do carbon dating and DNA and dietary isotopes all from the sample about that kind of size. And then the rest of the bone goes to uh, museums. In this case, we're very keen on, on a museum that is willing to keep the material cool because we think that's really important for DNA preservation. So we're looking for someone who's going to try, uh, and several museums have, have said that they are interested in storing this, uh, this material in a, um, in a system where the climate is controlled. You don't get big swings in temperature, which is one of the big problems in America in museums. That's it. There's no more questions. Cool. All right. Thanks. And we'll, we'll do some do some sampling.